Let's begin uh, today by reminding ourselves where we've gotten so far in following the journey of genetic information from DNA to proteins. In the last lecture, we focused on the process by which the information found in an organism's DNA, coded as a sequence of bases, is converted into a complementary strand of messenger RNA. Through this process, which we call transcription, we've now gotten a sequence of RNA that has a series of bases specifying a sequence of amino acids in the protein we're trying to build. Let me point out something that might or might not be apparent. The sequence of nucleotides in the messenger RNA transcript is actually complementary to the sequence um, on the strand of DNA from which it was copied. That is, if the template strand of DNA had a sequence A, T, A, A, G, G, C, then the corresponding mRNA would read U, A, U, U, C, C, G, because the RNA polymerase uses complementary base pairing. This is not really a critical point, but it's something to keep in mind if you're ever in the position of trying to decipher a string of nucleotides into a corresponding string of amino acids. You need to know if the string you're given refers to the DNA or the RNA. Usually, molecular biologists refer to the codon for a particular amino acid uh, in terms of the RNA sequence. Now, in today's lecture, what we want to do is to complete our, journey, our description of this journey of information, taking a closer look at the process that we call translation, where the mRNA uh, transcript um, is used as a template for building the protein itself. But before we do that, I want to spend just a moment locating in the cell where these processes are occurring, okay? You remember from the third lecture that the defining difference between the two main kinds of cells found in nature, prokaryotes on the one hand and eukaryotes on the other, is whether or not they have a nucleus. Eukaryotes have a nucleus and prokaryotes don't. The nucleus is where the DNA in eukaryotic organisms is found, separated from the rest of the cell. Prokaryotic DNA is not segregated in any way. This means that in eukaryotic cells, the processes of replication, by which we make more new DNA, and transcription, by which we make the mRNA, must occur in the nucleus, and they do. Translation, on the other hand, the process we're going to talk about today, occurs in the cytoplasm. This simply refers to the rest of the contents of the cell outside of the nucleus or outside of any other major organelles. In eukaryotes, then, the messenger RNA transcript must be exported out of the nucleus before translation can begin. And in fact, if you look closely at the nuclear envelope, you see that there are a lot of little pores. I mean, closely with an electron microscope, a lot of the little pores. And literally, the mRNA transcripts have to be transported through those pores from the nucleus out into the cytoplasm. In prokaryotes, transcription and translation and replication all occur in the same place, in the cytoplasm by definition, because prokaryotes have no organelles. Okay, now the first important thing we need to remember about the process of translation is the fact that here, the biochemical language changes from the language of nucleic acids to the language of proteins. The biochemistry of these two types of molecules is different in many ways, making it trickier for the information to flow across this boundary. The biggest issue we're going to face is to understand how we can establish some sort of specificity on the molecular level that allows a particular sequence of nucleotides, a codon, to be matched up with a uniquely specified amino acid. That's what we want to try to understand. The fundamental way we achieve the specificity that we saw in the processes of replication and transcription, remember, was complementary base pairing. This mechanism no longer works when we're trying to match up nucleotides with amino acids. As we'll see, cells have come up with an extremely clever trick for accomplishing just this task. Now, the process of translation involves three major players, let's call them. And we're going to talk about these three major players in turn to try to understand how translation works. First, there's the message. Second, there's the translator. And third, there's a protein building machine. It's really relatively simple. Now, of course, the message we know is the messenger RNA. Um, this is a long polymer, remember, that has no structure inherent in it other than the sequence of bases, a sequence of bases that specify codons that will eventually be used as information for a template for building the protein. 
The translator is a molecule of a different kind of RNA that we call transfer RNA, or tRNA for short. Now, this is, I say this is a different kind of RNA. It's, it's actually just RNA. It's a relatively short strand of RNA, only about 80 nucleotides long. It's different in the sense that it has a different function. Now, at this point, I want to point out something interesting about how DNA and RNA are related informationally. We've been talking about the information in DNA as being something that codes for proteins. And it does that using RNA as an intermediate. But there also must be sequences on the DNA that specify this other kind of RNA, which has a unique function acting just as a translator. So transfer RNA is never itself then used as a template for building anything else. It's just a kind of molecule that does this unique function acting, as we'll see in a minute, as the translator that connects information in nucleotide sequences to particular amino acids. It was Francis Crick. You remember him. He's one of the discoverers of the uh, DNA du double helix and also the person who originally articulated the central dogma of molecular biology. It was Francis Crick who predicted that there must be some kind of separate adapter molecule to get information from nucleic acids to proteins, and indeed, he was correct in his prediction. Let's take a closer look at the structure of transfer RNA. As I said, this is a short sequence of RNA, only about 80 nucleotides long. Unlike messenger RNA, it actually has an inherent higher order structure, a structure that comes about from complementary base pairing occurring di uh, across different parts of this strand. The shape of this can be diagrammed in a number of ways. The, the what I like to call the road-killed version of tRNA, just flattened out, can be drawn as kind of a, of a cross shape, or it's often called a T. In three dimensions, it actually looks more like kind of a crooked upside-down L. Now, there are two functional ends to a transfer um, RNA molecule, and that's what we want to turn to next. At one end of a tRNA molecule is what we call an anticodon. The anticodon is a triplet of bases that will form complementary base pairs with a codon of messenger RNA. So for example, the codon or a codon for the amino acid leucine is CUU. The three ba bases found in the anticodon of a tRNA that will interact with leucine is GAA, the complementary sequence. Now, there's a couple of points to make here. You can immediately guess that it's the anticodon end of a tRNA molecule that's going to be responsible for achieving specificity with the nucleic acid side of this equation using complementary base pairing. The other point is that the anticodon end of a tRNA is variable. That is, there are many kinds of tRNA molecules that are all the same, more or less, except for the three bases of the anticodon. And this is important, of course, because we're going to need a different anticodon for every amino acid that we want to um, bring to the translation process. Now, given that we know that there are 61 codons, remember there are 64 possible uh, combinations of three uh, um, uh, there are 64 possible combinations of four things taken three at a time, and we know that three of these combinations in the genetic code are used as stop codons, leaving 61 combinations that are actually coding for amino acids. So given that there are 61 codons that are functional codons in this sense, you might guess then that there should be 61 different kinds of tRNAs, one for each of the uh, codons coding for an amino acid. In fact, there are fewer tRNAs than this. There are only about 45 kinds of tRNAs. This is because some tRNAs recognize more than one codon. And this invariably occurs when the different codons that a single tRNA will recognize occur in the third position of the codon triplet. Remember, when we looked at the redundancy in the genetic code, we saw that by and large, this redundancy, different codons coding for the same amino acid, um, uh, occurred in differences in just the third position. So it turns out that on a molecular level, in the binding between an anticodon of a tRNA and the codon 
of the messenger RNA in which it will interact. The third position of that, code, of that codon and anticodon interaction has less of an influence on achieving some sort of hydrogen bonding molecular specificity in their connection. We call that relaxation third position wobble. Okay. Now, so we have a number of different tRNAs, each of which differs in its anticodon in a way that allows us to understand how, it can, how tRNAs can be specifically interacting with codons on messenger RNAs, which is the first part of the puzzle that we have to solve. The other end of a tRNA molecule, opposite the anticodon, is the place where the appropriate amino acid needs to be attached. Now, in the example I just gave, for example, you'd need to put a leucine on the end of that if you had an anticodon that was specifying leucine on the first end. In other words, the tRNA, in order to accomplish this translation, has to both recognize the right codon, and we can see how that can be done with complementary base pairing, and also has to be attached to the right amino acid corresponding to that codon. This is a trickier problem. Because if you look at the structure of tRNAs, it turns out that this end to which the amino acid will be attached does not vary. Every tRNA has the same end. And yet, somehow different amino acids, the appropriate amino acid, are connected up with the different appropriate tRNAs. So that's the key question we have to turn to now. How does the correct amino acid become associated with the correct tRNA? Well, the answer to that question comes from another molecule, which you might guess is an enzyme. It's an enzyme that has a name that um, I love and hate at the same time. Let me give you the name. These enzymes have had relatively easy names up to this point, but this one rolls off the tongue like um, a hot knife through butter. It's aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Now, that's a mouthful of a name, but it actually does specify, as I've told you, what the function of that enzyme is. It is an enzyme that synthesizes, synthetase, a bond between an amino acid, that's where the amino acyl comes in, and a tRNA. So amino acyl tRNA synthetase. Enzyme that synthesizes a connection between an amino acid and a tRNA. It's amino acyl tRNA synthetase that solves the problem I just posed, connecting up a particular tRNA with the right amino acid. But the question is, how does this do it? The way it does it is by having two separate binding sites, the amino acyl's tRNA synthetase. One binding site is specific for a particular transfer RNA. Now remember, the way that proteins function largely has to do with structure. So the structure of this protein has a region in it that will interact because of its shape and the unique physical char chemical characteristics of the um, molecule or the atoms around that uh, piece of the shape will interact specifically with just one kind of tRNA based on the structure of that tRNA. The other binding site of the amino acyl tRNA synthetase molecule is specific for just one kind of amino acid. So it's amino acyl... Uh, <laughs> So it's amino acyl tRNA synthetase, which knows how to recognize independently the tRNA and the amino acid associated with it. It's kind of like a matchmaker. It brings these two correct molecules together, and then once they've both bound to this enzyme, the enzyme catalyzes a strong bond between them, and they now leave the enzyme, and they're correctly attached. So we've solved the problem with the translator molecule being TR, uh, a tRNA and the correct connection with the amino acid being facilitated by this unique enzyme tRNA synthetase. We've solved the problem of connecting the language of amino acids to the language of nucleic acids. Well, now that we've got what you might call a, um, a charged tRNA, a tRNA with an amino acid, the correct one attached, now we get to the machine that actually builds the proteins, the third of our three major players that we started with. This machine is called a ribosome. If we were to use our enzyme naming scheme, we might want to call a ribosome a protein polymerase. 
because it is um, a structure that polymerizes amino acids to build polypeptide chains, which are proteins. It's not really a protein polymerase, though, because it's not just one enzyme. In fact, the ribosome is a very large, I mean massively large and very complex aggregate of a number of different molecules that work together. One of the major constituents of the ribosome is yet another kind of RNA. We call this ribosomal RNA, or rRNA for short. This ribosomal RNA makes up about 60% of the structure of the ribosome. The remaining 40% of the structure is made up of a number of different kinds of catalytic proteins. Again, the ribosomal RNA and the proteins all come together to form a large coherent unit. But the ribosome does act as a kind of protein polymerase in the sense that it's what brings the messenger RNA, the transfer RNAs together, and then forms chemical bonds between what will be adjacent amino acids in the protein when we're finished. Okay, let's take a break here and see where we are. We've got our three major players. We've got the messenger, we've got the translator, and we've got the protein builder. How do these major players work together in translation to actually build a protein? You can imagine, at this point, we could get into many, many details um, of exactly how ribosomes work. What we want to do, though, is to just uh, focus on the essential points about how these particular players get together to achieve what we know is the basic output that we have to get, which is the ordered uh, bonding of the series of amino acids for the particular protein that we're trying to build. For the sake of simplicity, we can separate the process of protein synthesis into three stages. We have to initiate the project, we'll call it initiation, get it started. Once we've gotten it started, then we can go through an extensive phase of just elongating the growing peptide chain, we'll call that elongation, and then we have to stop it, we have to terminate it. Now I separate these because what's critical to understand about these three, there, there are different things that are critical to understand about these three phases of protein synthesis. So let's start with how the process actually gets initiated. Ribosomes can be divided into, or are divided into, two main subunits, a larger subunit and a smaller subunit. Initiation, before initiation occurs, these two subunits occur separately in the cytoplasm of the cell. Initiation starts when a small subunit of the ribosome binds to two things. First, a messenger RNA molecule, we've got to get the message in, and also a special tRNA that acts as the initiator tRNA. Let's go back to the genetic code. You might guess at what that initiator tRNA is going to be specifying. It's going to have the uh, anticodon that corresponds to the start codon in the genetic code, AUG, which codes for methionine. So the initiator tRNA is going to have a methionine attached to it. Now, once we bring the messenger RNA, the initiator tRNA, and the small subunit of the ribosome together, then the other half of the ribosome, or the other larger half of the uh, ribosome, comes and sits on that complex, and transcription begins. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of geometry of uh, the ribosome so we can understand both this process of initiation and also how elongation occurs after we've initiated the process. If you sort of think of a ribosome very schematically, if you just draw a very simple schematic of a, of a ribosome, you're looking head-on at this ribosome, it's sort of a big globular say, shape, you'll see, or you could draw on that, what are effectively three different binding sites where tRNAs will interact with the molecule. And I'm going to just list these for you because the orientation of these will help provide insight into the initiation and elongation phase. On either end of the ribosome, we have what we'll call the A site and the E site. I'll tell you where these somewhat arbitrary, well, not arbitrary, but where these names come from. And in the middle, we have the P site. So imagine you've got a ribosome that's got binding sites that would fit tRNAs, three of them, the A site, the P site in the middle, and the E site on the other end. What happens during initiation 
is that the start codon of the messenger RNA and this initiator tRNA with the methionine, they sit down on the P site, the site in the middle of that uh, ribosome. Okay? Now, the messenger RNA, meanwhile, is spreading out along, and the next codon, the codon in the message that is adjacent to the start codon, will be overlaying the A site, adjacent to the P site. Okay, now picture this in your mind. We've got a methionine attached to an initiator uh, tRNA. Next to it, we've got an open binding site which has the messenger RNA codon for whatever should be the next amino acid in the sequence. This is where the process both gets started and how the process of elongation then can continue. Because the appropriate tRNA that has the anticodon for the codon that's now in the A site position, will come in and it will um, interact through complementary base pairing and sit in that A position. So now what we've got is a methionine, the very first amino acid, and next to it, whatever other amino acid should be added. Let's say it's a leucine. And they're juxtaposed next to each other because the tRNAs are juxtaposed next to each other on these binding sites, the P binding site and the A binding site. This is where the ribosome then takes those two amino acids and catalyzes a strong covalent bond between them. Actually what it does is it will take the methionine from that initiator tRNA and essentially break it off the initiator tRNA, add it to what is going to become a growing strand of, poly, of a polypeptide that is now attached to the second tRNA that came in. Okay, so now we have a tRNA, the second one that came in, which has attached to it two amino acids. We've started the chain. At this point, for elongation to occur, the whole ribosome and mRNA slide past each other by one codon unit. So now the tRNA that has two amino acids attached to it finds itself shifted over, or we say translocated, into the P site position. This is where the names come from, by the way, because the P there stands for peptidyl tRNA, because now this tRNA has more than just one amino acid, it actually has a peptide associated with it, whereas the, the tRNA that will come into the A site will only have an amino as, uh, acid, one amino acid associated with it, so we call that an amino acyl tRNA. Okay, now, meanwhile, the tRNA that we started with, that initiator tRNA, has been shifted over one position to what is called the E site. This stands, more simply, for the exit site. That tRNA's job is done, it's lost its amino acid, and it just drops off the complex and leaves. Now we have in the P site a tRNA that has two amino acids attached to it, and you can see how the process of elongation occurs from here. Because what will happen next is the next tRNA will come in, and there's a new codon now sitting in the A site position. This codon would be the third codon in the sequence, so the appropriate tRNA for that codon will come in, sit in the A site, the ribosome again catalyzes the bond between the two amino acids. Now we have a three amino acid chain. The, whole situ uh, the, the mRNA and the ribosome slide past each other with translocation again, and on and on and on. How many of our hundreds or even thousands of times is necessary to add in sequence all the appropriate amino acids? Well, the last stage in protein synthesis, termination, is actually not too difficult to understand because eventually at some point the advancing ribosome as it's moving relative to the messenger RNA will reach one of the three stop codons. Remember, those are codons, sequences of three bases, that don't code for any amino acid, and there is no corresponding tRNA. So once a stop codon is located in the A position of the ribosome, no tRNA will come in, and therefore no additional amino acid will be added to the growing polypeptide chain. What happens instead is another kind of protein a release factor, it's called, will come in instead, and that release factor actually ends up splitting the bond between the tRNA that's in the P site, the one that has all of the amino acids attached to it now strung out, and the amino acid chain, basically breaking the last link 
the amino acid chain is now completely free and the process of translation is completed. Well, we've talked about translation as we've been discussing the processes of the central dogma as though that's the whole end of the process. Actually, once a polypeptide has been formed in this way, at least a few other things happen to it. Uh, let me describe some of those. Uh, remember, all amino acid chains, all polypeptides, have to start with the amino acid methionine because that's what the start codon codes for. But not all proteins have methionine as the first amino acid in their chain. So at least one thing that has to happen in this whole process is that the methionine has to be cleaved off. But it can be actually quite a bit more um, uh, work that's done on proteins than that. So let me go back again and locate these processes in the cell. And the, the point I want to address just briefly is where are these ribosomes? Right? We know that in a eukaryotic cell they have to be in the cytoplasm because that's where the process of translation is occurring and of course in prokaryotes that's the only place that they can be. But actually there are two kinds of ribosomes if you will. Some of the ribosomes in a eukaryotic cell are in fact essentially freely floating in the cytoplasm. They're just out there. Others of these ribosomes, however, are actually physically attached to the membranes of the endomembrane system that we discussed briefly in Lecture 3. Remember, that's the system of interfolded membranes that can extend throughout um, a eukaryotic cell. These ribosomes that are attached to the endomembrane system, when they are synthesizing proteins, are actually putting the polypeptide chain product that they're producing onto the inside of the endomembrane system. So remember we described the one organelle of the endomembrane system that we described we called the endoplasmic reticulum. You will find in cells endoplasmic reticulum that's called rough endoplasmic reticulum, rough ER. And the reason it's called rough is because it actually physically has a whole bunch of little ribosomes attached to the membranes. And so if you look at it under a microscope, the membrane looks kind of rough, rough ER. Those are actually ribosomes attached to the endomembrane system. So when these ribosomes are synthesizing proteins, the output is put on the inside of the endomembrane system. And on the inside of this endomembrane system, a number of other things can happen to the protein that are essential for its eventual function. Remember that the protein sequence of amino acids determines its shape. And we talked about how that comes from the fact that the different side chains of amino acids have their own special chemical properties that causes it to, to twist and turn. But many amino acid chains can't quite get it right on their own. There is one most stable configuration that those side chains of their amino acid sequence will determine, but they need some help getting themselves folded in to the right position. It's sort of like having a spotter, or actually a whole series of spotters. We call these spotters, if you will, chaperone proteins because there are a whole number of chaperone proteins that will help the protein fold up correctly. And in the absence of correct chaperone proteins, the protein might not quite get it right. Proteins also have a number of other compounds added to them. Very commonly, proteins will have a, a, a part of a sugar added to them. We call these kinds of proteins glycoproteins. So another post-translational processing event is the addition of sugars or some other chemical groups to these proteins, things that weren't directly specified by the sequence of uh, codons. Finally, these proteins can be labeled to, as to where they're going. Elements will be added to these proteins, I should say um, molecular elements will be added to these proteins that identify where they're going to eventually end up, either in different parts of the cell or outside the cell. You can think of these as address labels that get added to the proteins so that as the endomembrane system passes these proteins to different parts of the cell, it know, the proteins essentially know, or they don't know, but the units that are moving them know where to send the proteins. Okay, so here at last we've gotten to finished proteins. We've seen information move all the way from DNA into proteins where we need it to do the stuff of cells.
In the next lecture, we're going to be, been, begin to ask what happens when the information stored in DNA of organisms changes. First, we're going to ask how can it be changed, and this will lead us to a series of lectures which will address what the consequences are of changing the information in DNA.